One of the advantages of working with Java is that there is a vast library of built-in data structures which are at your disposal. But before we look at these data structures in detail, let's look at a more abstract underlying principle as to how they are organized. So this is to do with indirection. So what do we mean by indirection? Well, let's first go back to the notion of an abstract data type. So one of the guiding principles of defining abstract data types was to separate the public interface from the private implementation. Right? So the idea was that if we had, for instance, something like this, which is a generic queue, then it has these public methods associated with it. Namely, you can add an element at the end of the queue, you can remove an element from the front of the queue, and maybe you can query the length of the queue by calling the size function. Now, when we come to a concrete implementation, this will have, based on the implementation, some way of reporting those things. So here is something which is called a circular array. So in a circular array, we have, as you can see, an array. An array is just a block of storage, right? And now we designate where the queue starts and where the queue ends. So here the queue starts at this point and it ends at this point. So the queue is actually between these two. Now the idea is that if I remove an element from the queue, then this element will be deleted and the head will move down by one. If I add an element to the queue, then this element will get populated and I will move the tail down by one. So that's how the circular array works under normal circumstances. So what will happen over time is that the head will move down and the tail will go beyond the boundary and then this is where the circularity comes in, it wraps around. So here is a situation where the queue starts at the bottom and actually continues to the top and comes here. So this is a circular array implementation of a queue. So as we move the head down, we walk down the array and then as the tail moves down, if it reaches the end, it goes back to the top and comes to the top, right? So this is one concrete way of implementing that. Now with respect to this, of course, I, I've already indicated how you would do the add and the remove, right? The remove will just take the element currently pointed to by head and then increment head. Tail would move the tail position down by one and populate the new value there. That would be the add operation and size will tell you the number of elements between head and tail modulo the circular shift. So another way that we could implement a queue would be using what is called a linked list, right? So we have a list of nodes and each node points to the next node and the head points to the first position, and the tail points to the last position. So now if I add something, I will add a new node here and if I delete the head of the queue, if I remove something, then I will remove this one and make this head point here. So these are two competing ways of implementing that abstract data type queue. So as an implementer, I could choose either one and the whole point of an abstract data type is that the public interface is unchanged. So as a user of the queue, the use of these functions add and remove and size will not be affected by the choice of implementation. But the question is, although the functionality, that is the way that these functions behave is not affected by the implementation, is it true that the user is actually indifferent to these choices? So we can see that these choices are very different in the way they represent the data and this has some implications for performance, for example. So the interface only talks about the input output behavior of the function. It says if I give you, if I call a function, then this is what I expect. If this current state of the data structure is this, and if I call a function, then this is the value that I expect to get back. But it doesn't tell you how long it will take or how efficient it's going to be. So if you look at efficiency, for instance, it appears that this is better. And the reason for that is that we have effectively one block of storage which we start off with and after that we are just working within this block. So there is no extra work as the queue shrinks, uh, the queue grows and shrinks. The storage remains the same. We are just manipulating a pointer, this head and tail, these indices within the existing storage. So accessing the queue and updating the queue is a very efficient thing. However, notice that we are limited by the number of elements that we allocated to start with. So if we want a flexible queue that can grow to any size, then the circular array is likely to run into problems because we run out of space in case the queue becomes very large. So in such a situation, the linked list might be better. Right? So if we have no clear indication at the beginning of how large our queue might be, then we may prefer a linked list. So therefore, these two are not quite the same, even though from an interface perspective they are identical, there are observable differences from the point of view of usability. So to get around this, we might tell the user that there are two different implementations and you choose, right? 
So we can create two separate classes instead of having that one class Q which had a hidden implementation which the user had no control over. Now we provide the user with two implementations. So if you want a circular array queue, you pick up this one. If you want a linked list queue, you pick up this one. Now the interface is the same. So these three functions are the same. So as far as using it, there's no problem. But it's a question of the other aspects, right? Efficiency and, and flexibility and so on. So the user might choose, for instance, to have a queue of dates using a circular array queue and a queue of strings using a linked list queue. And so when you create it, of course, you then define it, you declare it up here and then you instantiate it. Similarly, you declare it up here and you instantiate it. Right? So this is one solution to this problem of providing different implementations with different features and then we allow the user to choose the implementation that they prefer. So what is the downside of this? Well, the downside or the disadvantage of this is that now we might not understand when we start running our code whether one implementation is preferable to the other one. So for instance, in this case, we chose the circular array queue for dates and later on we might discover that due to some unforeseen uh, way in which our application is being used, that's not really a practical assumption to assume that the array size is fixed in advance. We actually need a flexible one. So how do we fix this? Well, we have to go back in our code, right? And we have to change this declaration. And of course, we have to change the corresponding call here. But this is not all, right? We would have taken this data structure and we would have been using it all over the place in our code. So wherever we use it, wherever we have a function that uses this date queue, we would have used the circular array queue as an argument. And wherever we declared some new temporary variables to hold, say, a parallel queue uh, while we are doing something with it, we would have again used the circular array queue. So there will be a lot of instances of the circular array queue which have crept into our code as a result of this design decision right at the beginning that we are going to use a circular array queue for date queue. And now if I want to change that particular design decision to a linked list queue, I have to be careful to go and fix all these places where I've made this change. So how do we get around this particular disadvantage? So now we come back to our favorite interfaces, right? So Java provides us with this interface, which is capturing purely the capabilities. So if we create, our first thing was to create an abstract class Q, right? So we created this Q, which had a public interface and we said the private implementation is written. So what if we keep only the interface part? So, right, instead of making it a class, we make it an interface, right? So we just provide these three abstract functions, add, remove, and size, and say that now a real Q will actually implement this. Now, what we do is we make our two concrete implementations, the ones that we just described before, instead of making them separate implementations where the user has to choose, where they are still separate implementations that the user has to choose from, but they both implement this interface, right? So they are both tied to this uh, right? So we have this Q on the top, which is an interface, and below that, these are both kind of children of that class in terms of the class hierarchies, right? So the circular array queue and the linked list queue are both now implementations of that. So since they are both implementations of that, now we can use this compatibility of these class names across this hierarchy. And now we can use the interface name to declare, right? So instead of committing that a date queue is going to be a circular array queue and a string queue is going to be a linked list queue, we just say that they are both queues, right? And this is enough given that the interface is implemented, it's enough to know that the public functions available for Q are available here. And thanks to the fact that we have this dynamic dispatch, the actual choice of these functions will be guided by the actual implementation, right? So when I create the concrete Q, right? Date Q is expecting an arbitrary Q, but it is willing to take a circular array Q. So now if I take date Q and I do add remove, it would apply those functions as they are defined in circular array Q. And similarly, string queue will apply the functions as they're applied in linked list queue. So we don't seem to have done much, okay? We basically have postponed this decision of where to choose between the two implementations to the instantiation, right? So the main thing is that we are not declaring it upfront to be of one concrete type or the other concrete type. We are using this abstract interface. And now we are postponing the instantiation, or the choice to the instantiation. 
But the advantage of this is that this is called indirection, right? I am not referring to a concrete uh, this q or that q type, I am saying it is a q. So, I am kind of pointing to an abstract concept which represents the concrete thing that I want. So, I am indirectly saying that I am choosing one of these two, but I will tell you later on which one I am choosing. So, this is this indirection. So, the advantage of indirection is supposing I change my de decision, I have to of course go back and reinstantiate date q correctly. But presumably, since date q itself was defined only to be an abstract q, every function and every other auxiliary variable that I wrote throughout my code was also just declared to be an abstract q. So, all those declarations do not have to change anymore. So, the amount of update that I have to make to my code is limited. So, the benefit of using this interface to capture the abstract part and then separate out the concrete part into an implementation of the interface gets us a lot of benefits in terms of updating the code if we happen to choose the implementation later. So, this is the kind of way in which uh, Java organizes its data structures. So, it is it is important to understand this motivation for it. So, basically we can use interfaces to flexibly choose between multiple concrete implementations. So, that is the real model of the story. So, interfaces in addition to all the other things. So, remember we first introduced interfaces partly it looked like a reaction to the fact that Java does not supply uh, support multiple inheritance. So, we said if you want to keep track of multiple capabilities in a class, we allowed it to support these multiple abstract interfaces. But interfaces actually have a much larger role to play in some sense in the context of object oriented programming and object oriented thinking. Right? They give you this level of indirection. So, just to drive home this idea of indirection, so that you know you have something to uh, that tangible that you can remember it by. So, suppose we have an organization in which senior staff are provided with an office car. Okay, this is not unusual that people uh, who are at a senior level in an organization are provided with transportation by their company. So, if I take this literally, right, if I take the concrete implementation view of this, right, then each official who has access to an office car will be assigned a car. So, the organization will maintain a fleet of cars right? and one car will be assigned to one employee who is entitled to that car. So, there will be for example, the president's car, there will be the vice president's car, the director's car and so on. So, now the problem with this concrete assignment is that each car of course, is prone to its own problems and so, if a car breaks down, then that particular official is deprived of a car till the problem is, is resolved. So, how do we make this indirect? Well, we can say that a, an office car is not a concrete object, but it is an abstract thing. It is a transportation device which is provided by the office to this official for office use. Now, it is no longer required that this particular vehicle must be maintained as an individual vehicle for that particular officer. So, for in particular, for instance, we could imagine that the office itself does not allocate one car per staff member and maybe it has a few spare cars. So, maybe if there are five people who are entitled to cars, the office actually keeps maybe six or seven cars in its pool. And at any given time, when an official needs a car, one of the cars from this pool is assigned. Right? So, this means that even if there is a probability of one or two cars being under maintenance, not every official will need their office car at the same time presumably, but also there will be a possibility of taking an alternative car in case the car that they normally prefer is not available. So, this is one possible way in which indirection will work. But of course, the benefit of indirection is that this is not now the only solution to the problem. Right? Our problem was we wanted to provide an office car, but we did not want to fix the office car because that has problems of of this flexibility because if the office car breaks down, we cannot do it. So, one possibility is to have a pool of cars and not assign, but we do not even have to maintain a pool of cars. Supposing we do not want to have this extra headache of maintaining a workshop at, or people train mechanics to deal with these cars, we can convert this whole thing into what is now in economics called an outsourced model. right? So, we could now have a contract with a taxi company and say that whenever an office officer needs a car, we will book a car through you and you must provide it. So, now this means that the cars themselves and this whole headache of main ensuring that a car is available and in good condition and all is transferred to the taxi company. But as far as the state, uh, this organization is concerned and the of officer who is entitled to a car is concerned, he or she has an office car at their disposal. Right? So, it is still a solution to the original abstract question through indirection. And one could go even one step further. Supposing you do not want to go through this hassle of negotiating a contract 
with a taxi company because then you have to go through tendering and all kinds of other processes that your organization might require. You might just strike a deal with these people who are entitled to office cars saying you take a taxi and provide a bill and we will reimburse it. So effectively now the, the burden of, of arranging the office car has been transferred back to the official but still the cost involved with this is no longer there. Right. So this is an example of how indirection can make the solution to a problem extremely flexible compared to a rigid solution where you have to choose one implementation or another implementation. So, in fact, there is a kind of uh, half humorous thing attributed to this very uh, well-known computer scientist called Butler Lamson who won the Turing Award in 1992 and Butler Lamson was one of the original researchers at this uh, organization called Xerox Park and he is widely credited with everything that we are now used to as a personal computer, right? In the days when all computers were these large wardrobe size things which fitted in one big room, he had the vision to imagine a personal computer with a mouse and, and a, a kind of a keyboard interface which people could use and so on. So anyway, so what Butler Lamson said is that any problem, all problems in computer science can be solved by adding one more level of indirection, right? So don't fix, don't insist that this must be, uh, give it a name. And then later on decide what you will do to fill that name. Right? So, in fact, this has jokingly be called the fundamental theorem of software engineering. So, it's a, in a way, it's a bit of postponement, right? You're postponing the decision to as late as possible so that you're not stuck with an early decision which is suboptimal. So, this is the principle, as I said, behind which this Java collections, as they are called, are organized. So, it's useful to understand why they are doing this because otherwise it might look a little strange that something as simple as providing you know, a bunch of user uh, uh, system defined data structure should be so uh, bureaucratically complicated. 